goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the living God will stand forever and ever. Amen. Did what I just read make you mad? Because this, the, 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 the temptation is always to sentimentalize Scripture. And if there's one of the parables that we do that the most with, or that we're the most risk of doing that with, it's this one. Because it is such an extraordinary tale of God's love, we can miss the point of this parable. And it would have infuriated its original hearers, particularly the Pharisees. We find ourselves here in a section of Luke's gospel that begins back in chapter 15 and verse 1, where there's these, the Pharisees are grumbling over and over because sinners are drawing near to Jesus over and over. And it culminates in chapter 16 and verse 32, I think, where Jesus finishes with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And at the end of that story, you know, the the rich man is in hell and he says, please send my brothers back that they might warn people. And he says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And even if one were raised from the dead, they wouldn't listen. The point of this whole section, these two chapters, is a rebuke of the Pharisees. And that's why it starts off here. The, the sinners drawing near, the tax collectors grumble, or the, the uh, tax collectors drawing near, sinners drawing near, Pharisees grumbling. Jesus tells these three stories lost coin, lost sheep, and lost son. And each one is like a crescendo building up to what I just read and what we just read from Luke 15. And what we need to do is step back into the shoes of the original hearers this morning. And look at how God relates to us and what it teaches us about how to relate to God. This is fundamentally a parable about who God is and what it means to relate to him. And if we miss that, we miss the point of the parable as a rebuke to a wrong understanding of God on both sides of the younger son and the older son. And so what I want us to see is there's there's two things here. There's God's grace for the irreverent, And God's grace for the reverent, as it were, in this parable. God's grace for the irreverent and God's grace for the reverent. If you go back, and we we won't read it all again, but let's look at this, this story Jesus tells about the first place, this young man, this prodigal son, who has done what would have been deemed the most shameful thing a son could do in that culture. When it says, give me my share of the property, he wasn't going to his dad asking for a loan saying, Dad, I want to go sow my wild oats. When a son demanded that in this culture, he's saying, give me what would have been mine as if you were dead. It'd be like me going to my dad and saying, Dad, look, I know there's a will. Uh, Hopefully I'm in it. Uh, I haven't done anything to get out of it. Um, When you die, I know there's something coming to me. Go ahead and give it to me now uh, because you're dead to me. That's essentially what the son is saying to the father. The most shameful, insulting thing you could have done in a shame and honor culture like this one. And so we're introduced to this character that immediately every Jewish guy, Pharisee or tax collector, would have gone, yeah, he's worse than me. This is the worst of the worst. And then Jesus compounds it. He says, okay, so he goes, and what does he do with the money? He goes and spends it on prostitutes. Remember, this is a society, again, controlled by the law of God. What was the penalty for doing that? If you, if you had sex with somebody outside of marriage and you, you know, there, there, there could be a death penalty involved, okay, for what this guy had done. Certainly, there was a death penalty involved. Deuteronomy 21, 21, if a son did something like this, he was to be stoned to death. Then he ratchets it up again and says, not only did he go sleep with as many prostitutes as he could, he became a pig herder. Now, as you remember, if you've read the Old Testament, these were the the unclean of the unclean animals. To this day, devout Jews do not eat pork. Pigs are seen as unclean. So he is in the worst profession 
after committing what they would consider the worst sin and becoming one of the worst kinds of people you could think of. And at this point, if they, Jesus were to stop right there, they would have all said, yep, that guy's gone. Forget about him. He, you know, even the tax collector, I think, would have gone, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm probably not as righteous as these Pharisee types, but I'm not like him. Then he begins this description in verse 20, that when the son comes to himself, he says, I'm going to go home. And notice that that comes through. He says, I, I, he came to himself. He says, I'm going to arise and go to my father. A shift has taken place in his understanding of what his father is like. And he says, I'm going to go home. Now, there's a, a, sketch, a couple of sketches that were done by a, um, an artist, uh, Edward Brunard, I think, Swiss artist, turn of the century. He did a number of sketches on the parables. And most of us, I think, might be familiar with uh, Rembrandt's illustration of the prodigal's homecoming. It's kind of the most famous painting of this. The Brunard sketch, to me, is the most powerful one I've ever seen uh, of the, illustrating this parable. And what he sketched was, it's just pencil, he sketched this uh, would have been 19th century figure looking over a beautiful balcony and obviously a wealthy man, but it was the, the sketch of the prodigal's father and he has his hands over his face, his hand over his face to shield himself from the sun. And Bernard captures this yearning earnestness of the father. And that's what Jesus tells us about who this father is. He says, and he rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off. And that's what I think that sketch captured. I want you to picture this father. And if you're a parent here, you know the love you have for your children. You know what you want for them. And if your child's in any danger, you will not sleep well until you know that child is safe. So think about this father knowing what his son was going to do and saying, Okay, son, have it your way. He's standing there every day, probably thinking to himself, maybe today is the day he's coming back. Maybe today I'll see my son again. Dr. Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson, who was a senior pastor for a number of years at our church in Columbia, told a story once about what it's like to see your son. He, he told this story of playing golf, and he, he's a good golfer. His son's a golfer, I believe, and he was walking up, and he just saw his sons standing off in the distance, and just by their silhouettes, he knew them, and he thought to himself, ah, my sons. That's how this father felt. He, he saw him, he said, my son. Who knows how long it was? Every day, didn't really matter in one sense, every day felt like an eternity to this father, as it would for all of us to know that a beloved son was lost. He's hoping, he's nervous, his heart broken. And then can you imagine, could it be? Hope starts to rise in his heart. Is that him? As he sees on the horizon, this silhouette walking, walking slowly, stumbling maybe towards home. And when, when it tells us there, verse 20, he saw and felt compassion. The, the original there means something like close to the gut. We talk about gut-wrenching compassion. Where you just overwhelmed with love for something or someone. Now, we again have to put ourselves in this culture as much as we can. It would have been unthinkable for a man of this stature. So we obviously know he's wealthy. He's got this robe, this signet ring. He's got a fattened calf. All of that signified wealth in this society. So we know he's well off. And if the son could take his half of the inheritance and the father can still live and the other son can still live, he had a lot of money. He gave that. And if his son could spend that and come back, this signifies this was a man of position and rank and wealth. And he did something that nobody of that stature would do. He ran towards his son. As one scholar notes, um, even today, the standard Arabic translation of this parable says hurried, not ran. The Greek word clearly is ran, almost sprinted is what the word signifies. And it's because even in that culture today, you don't do that if you're a man like this. Jesus begins to shatter our categories again. He's already done it with this younger son. Now, again, we think people may have been melting with love 
at this point of going, man, what kind of a God is this? This is where the anger would have started. Wait a minute, no, 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 that's not right. He wouldn't have run. He wouldn't have felt compassion. He would have obeyed the law. He would have picked up a stone and began and said, welcome home, son, time to die. And and then Jesus shatters that and says, he ran. He sprinted pure, unbridled joy at his son's return. Here's what I think Jesus is telling us right at the outset about what our father is like. What the older son and the younger son missed is that, as Jesus would tell us in Luke's gospel elsewhere, which of you, having bread, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone, or asked for a fish, would give him a scorpion? Here's what I love about this, that, that, uh, that part of Jesus' teaching. He says, if you then being evil, once again, where's the gospel start? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here's the point, and here's what he's illustrating here. Your father is far more generous and loving and kind than you will ever imagine in your default setting, whether you're irreverent or reverent. And here's something more particular about your father's love. He always moves toward you. He comes to us. He seeks us out. He runs after us. And I lived most of my life as a non-Christian. And when I came across this teaching for the first time, it is the most beautiful thing in the world to think of God moving towards us. The Father sprinting to meet someone who least deserved it. After squandering his money, living in sin, flagrant, open, high-handed, willful sin, running to meet him. And then it tells us when he he sees him, the son begins his well-rehearsed speech. I'm going to say the right things. Maybe I won't get stoned. At the very least, it can't be worse than eating pig pods. Maybe that's how he reasoned. Maybe I won't get stoned and and, and I can just eat in my father's, I can just stop having this gnawing hunger. And he begins his speech and it's like you can picture the father cutting him off. And he did something here that, again, men of his stature didn't do. And the the original here has an, an implication of ongoing. He was kissing and kissing him. It's like a lost child returned to a mother. Or a father who just embraces that child and all you want to do is just give him as much love and affection as you can. And that's what Jesus says the father does. Not just welcome. Not just a kind of distant, okay, we're glad you're home, son. Falling all over him. Throwing aside any kind of social conventions. Because his son was back. And nothing else matters when what you love the most has come home. And so Jesus shatters our second category, our categories for a second time. Pure joy, embracing, kissing, pure love. Nothing mattered but that his son was home. It gets better. Then Jesus begins this description. If, if, if they were mad at this point, they would have been outraged at what followed. In fact, look what he says there. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Let me pause there. Do you know what that best robe would have been? It would have been the the wedding garment that the firstborn son would have worn on the day of his wedding. Best we can tell. That would have been his older brother's top tier, perfectly cut Brooks Brothers tuxedo. That they came, he said, I'm so overwhelmed, go get that and put it on him. The signet ring would have been like the ancient equivalent of the Visa black card. Unlimited spending power. You need anything, son? Put it on my account. You need to go and and be wealthy again? You've got it. And then one of the most poignant things I think he says is, put shoes on his feet. Slaves went barefoot at this time. That's why foot washing is such a big deal. 
When Peter says to Jesus, you will never do this, you'll never wash my feet, because slaves went barefoot, and I want you to think about going barefoot in first century, no indoor plumbing, no modern conveniences, walking around barefoot Israel. Okay, so like walking around barefoot with no sandals on your feet, mean they, like there's like horse excrement on the street, human excrement, nasty trash, all that stuff is caking your feet as you walk along. Slaves didn't wear shoes. Sons did. So when he said put the shoes on his feet, that was kind of the capstone of this welcome home. You are not a stranger anymore, he's saying to this son. You are home for sure. Put on your shoes. That's what he says to him. Here's Here's what Jesus is picturing for us in this this person. And I want to say that we know a lot of these people and you might be one of them. This is the person today who says, you know, I don't really care about spirituality. That's cool if you're into it. I'm about one thing, having a great time. And I'm going to go try that. And I would suggest to you that's our main religion today in America. Let's go just have as much fun as we can. I want experiences. I want to do my thing. I just want to just express myself. So many covenant children running away from Jesus just like this. So many children raised in churches who who go, that's just narrow and constricting, and I want to go live in the big city and find myself and find real life. I want to live I uh, saw the movie Bombshell recently, which is just uh, a movie about this, uh, the, the scandal of Roger Ailes and Fox News. And of course, um, you know, Hollywood's not sympathetic to evangelical Christianity. One of the characters in there is this naive girl who comes to work at Fox News, who she says one scene, you know, Fox News is like my parents' religion. He, he's equivalent to Jesus, uh, Bill O'Reilly or something like that. And what it paints is her as this character who has, you know, grown up in this real staid evangelical home and flees that to go to New York and now is going to find herself. And it's just like as I I saw that, I thought, these script writers will never get over their cliches, will they? And it's a cliche for a reason though, right? In that so many people who've been raised in Christian homes, like this young man was, Best we can tell us is devout Jewish man. Devout Jewish men prayed with their sons, read the scriptures to their sons. Again, that was part of daily life. That wasn't a negotiable. And this guy goes, I'm going to find myself somewhere else. Pleasure seeking. Why, why, do we, why do we see so much of that in our society today? I think there's so many reasons. One of which, as we mentioned in the last se- session, is if you tell people long enough that you're nothing but evolved pond scum, then yes, Going to do ecstasy is going to see a whole, a whole lot better than the day-to-day drudgery so many people experience. Having as much sex as you possibly can with as many different people is going to seem so much more attractive than following Jesus. Yes, to all, that's what going, it's going to seem like. And here's the painful lesson the younger brother learned that so many are learning in our day. If you chase pleasure your whole life, and that's all you're about, and that's all you're after, it will leave you empty. Do we need any more stories about that by celebrities, right? That's the ultimate cliche now. I had a friend who worked for the New England Patriots for a while, and I remember, I, I don't really care about the Pats that much. I was a Cowboys fan, but sorry. Um, we, uh, we, we followed the Pat- Patriots some, and I remember after, I think it was the third Super Bowl, Tom Brady won. After marrying the most sought-after supermodel in the world. Okay, it's like, if you're going to dial up your life and you're a, a, you know, a guy in America, it's like, be the best athlete, get the most money, marry the prettiest girl. That's Tom Brady's life. And do you remember what he said in that CBS 60 Minutes interview? Three Super Bowl rings on his finger. He said, there's got to be more to it than this. It broke my heart. He's never going to have to worry about money. His great-grandkids will never have to worry about money. He can walk in the room and go, yeah, I'm better than you on sports. I am. How do you know? Well, here's my stats. And by all accounts could walk in and say, I have married the prettiest girl in the room. Everything so many people strive after. And he goes, there's, there's, there's got to be more. That's what the prodigal son was saying to himself. There's got to be more 
I thought it was more in prostitutes, and now I'm with pigs. And that's how it always works, friends. If we give our lives to prostitutes, we end up with the pigs. It will happen. No matter how long it's delayed, that is coming if you're seeking a life of pleasure-seeking because life will be over before you know it and bodily pleasures will cease. And then what will you have? That is coming to all of us. We're all losing the battle with gravity and waistlines and everything else. And we are losing the battle to the fall, the effects of the fall all around us. Then what? When you're no longer young, Nobody values you for your looks anymore, then what? If you lose all your money, nobody will be your friend because you don't have any money, then what? If you've got the winning personality that might be taken away by an accident or disability, then what? You see, here's what what the pleasure-seeking lifestyle lied to the prodigal and lies to all the people around us today and says, is that don't ever worry about tomorrow. Forgetting, as we were, we were talking at breakfast this morning, I was just because I'm fascinated again by the mountains and the fog and everything else, and it was disappearing fast. And, um, you know, Christine was telling me it can be gone by the time you're, you know, done with breakfast. And it goes away so fast, the fog around here. And I thought, what a perfect illustration of what James tells us. Your life is a vapor. And the pleasure-seeking person never wants to hear that. Imagine if the dad had, had said to him, son, life's a vapor. He didn't. We don't know why. But his son learned that lesson. It's a vapor and it's over before you know it. And then what? So Jesus shatters some categories. And he reminds us, when you come, it's because God's called you. And when you come to him, what will you find? What can you expect? Joy, adoption, love, blessing, generosity beyond your wildest dreams. That's who he is. That's what he's like. That's what he's like with people who absolutely don't deserve it. And how many of us live as if we could earn that? As if we deserved it? And relate to God that way? We'll come back to that at the end. Let's look at God's grace for the reverent. The scene shifts in verse 25. A party's being thrown. We'll talk about that in the next session. Isn't it great to have a God who loves to talk about feasting? I just love that. Just read Isaiah and God's like, you know, there's going to come a day when all of this is going to be gone and we're going to feast. We'll talk about that in the next session. But there's a party going on. And notice, both sons are afar off. One's coming in from a field of pigs. One's coming in from his father's field. As he came and drew near to the house. It's one of those things like, I can remember um, on our street, there, there was somebody who is, uh, we, we have kind of like a, a pretty cool mix of like older people and younger people in our street. And like one night during the Christmas time, we were out to walk our dog and we got to the bottom of the hill where kind of like these bunch of young couples live and you could hear the party. Like, you know, like the thump of the music, people laughing and having a good time and it was beautiful and we walked by and that's what this guy heard. So imagine like when he comes in from the fields, there's no modern farm equipment. He is sweaty and nasty. He's been slaving away for his dad, and he sees a party going on, and his heart sinks and goes, you've got to be kidding me. He didn't know yet what's going on, but that's got to be his first thought, right? I've been out here working all day. Notice again, mindset problem here. I've been out here working. Who are they to throw a party? And then... Again, Jesus is going to make people angry. He was ang- this, this, this son was angry because of what he heard. The servants come to him, and he asked, imagine like a servant running by with another tray to serve somebody. Hey, what's going on? Your brother's home. What? I mean, again, you imagine just the anger, and it tells us he's angry. And notice again, here Jesus is going to make his heroes angry. Once again, what does the father do? He did this for the younger son. He does it for the older son. He goes out to him. Another shameful act has occurred with this son. First son, you're dead to me. Second son, you're dead to me in a different way. I'm not going in. That would have been shameful. That would have been disobedient. That would have been worthy of disinheritance in this culture. And again, 
Fathers didn't go out. You refuse to come into my party. You are shaming this family. You deserve to die. That's how it works. We may not understand it. It may be hard for us to understand, but the father goes out. And again, Luke uses a very particular word here when it says the father pled with him to come back inside. It was, the literal translation would be, was pleading and pleading. Son, please, please, son, don't do this. Don't do it like this. Please come in. And again, that's unheard of for a father to do. And and here's what this pictures for us. Here's what this older son right off the bat pictures. Notice how both the sons misunderstand their father in different ways. The first son thinks he's stingy in one way. Father, you don't want me to have any fun. And I'm going to go get it on my own terms then. The second son goes, you don't want me to have any fun, but I'm going to keep working really hard because I know you're a stern taskmaster. And as Sinclair Ferguson points out in his book, The Whole Christ, These represent two different kinds of ways of relating to God that are at root the same. Both misunderstand God, and that goes back to the garden. This goes back to the sin of Eve. Has God indeed said you shouldn't eat of any tree in the garden? What does she do? She says, yep, that's right. God's stingy. He didn't want us to have any fun. He doesn't want us to enjoy things. That's what both sons thought. And both have a mistaken view of what their father is like. Neither of them understand his generosity. The younger son thinks, you're keeping me from fun and you don't want me to enjoy life. The older son thinks, I've done everything and you won't give me anything. And that's how, that's how if I can put it like this, churchy people tend to relate to God. You know, I am doing my devotions. I am giving to the church. I am giving of my time. Why is life so hard? Why don't I feel close to God? I know, God, that I'm not supposed to feel like this, but I do. I feel like you're not there and you don't care about me. I've given everything for you and I don't have anything to show for it. That's the mindset of the older brother here. And both have misunderstood what their father was like. And so how does he correct that? Verses 31 and 32 He says to them, look what he says to the the son. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. You didn't go out like your brother and leave. And he's speaking here to the religious leaders. He's speaking to the Pharisees saying, you've had innumerable years of privilege of studying the word of God and getting to know the God of the scriptures and you don't know him. And he says that to all kinds of so, you know, people who profess Jesus who still have this mindset that their father's stingy. They've been to Bible studies and they still don't get grace. Still hasn't come home to them. They've heard preaching for years and they still are kind of bitter with a low level of despair running through their lives because, because they think God's not done them right. That's what the older brother was doing. You didn't give me mine. And here's what the father says. You are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. All that is mine is yours. Okay, just pause right there. What kind of a God have we just met? Who says everything I have is yours. Everything. What kind of a God is this? Where else would you meet him but on the pages of Scripture? You will never find anything similar to this in the Quran, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the Watchtower Tract Society. You'll never find a God who says, all that is mine is yours. I am generous and I love you. And you have underestimated my generosity. You have underestimated what kind of God I am. And here's the way to test if you're falling into this older brother thinking. Because notice how he responds. This son of yours. Can you just hear it dripping off his lips? This son of yours. Comes. Here's what you do. Give him everything that was mine. He squandered our family inheritance. I've had to work harder because he's been gone. Can't you hear the argument? And the father, the father looks at him and says, son, I think you, th- you think you know I love you, but you think I don't really like you. 
And that's how so many of us can slip into our thinking of God, isn't it? Sure, God loves me, but I don't think he really likes me. I think he puts up with me. I think he's kind of probably default setting cranky with me. I think he's probably arms folded if I've wandered away and I want to come home. Both sons thought that. God, my father will not accept me, and he doesn't care for me, and he's stingy, and he doesn't want to share. He doesn't love me. And what Jesus is telling us here about who he is and how we relate to God through him is that God's love is not something to be earned and kept, but to be received and enjoyed. You cannot earn it. You cannot keep it in your own strength. It's given freely. And isn't, don't miss the irony here. Who's saying this? It's the son who will give himself to show us the extravagant generosity of the father. He gave us his best for the worst, for you and me. The father's the one who has to foot the bill in both cases. The father's the one to whom it costs everything for the sons to be forgiven so that many sons can come in. You see, when we are like this older brother, we don't understand the last words here of verse 32. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and he is alive. Fitting? Fitting? Can you just hear him saying that? Fitting, Father? No, what's fitting is I get mine. He gets punished. And we get this whole world cosmic justice thing right for once. It's got to be something along the lines of what he was thinking. And, and here's what, what Jesus is telling us and saying to the Pharisees and making everybody mad in the process. You think God is one way. I have come to reveal to you that he is exactly the opposite. You and I, in default settings, think God must be related to through working, through earning, through good deeds, and when we throw those off, we can throw off constraint like the younger brother and just do life our way and grab all the gusto we can get and live for ourselves and do the Wendy's philosophy of, of life, do what tastes right. That's how we think about it. And here's what Jesus has said to us. You do not understand my, fart, my father's heart for sinners. You do not understand that he is anxious for sinners as it were. Now, I am well aware God is impassable and doesn't have emotions. Yes, 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 I know that. Here's what the scriptures tell us. As Calvin said, he lisps to us in ways we can understand. One of the ways he's doing that is saying, recognize my Father's heart for sinners. And the greatest proof that you will ever see of his hearts for sinners, Jesus is telling us, is me. Is my death on the cross for sinners like you and me. That's what Jesus is is saying to all of us here this morning. So here's, here's a way to test yourself again. Are you like the older brother? Maybe you say, God, I thank you that I'm not like the lesbian down the street. I don't struggle with homosexual temptations. Thank you for not making me like that. Or maybe you're like the younger brother and you, you're kind of more on the other side of things and you go, God, thank you that I'm not like those red state Republicans. They are so ignorant. Who would vote for Trump? In both cases, we're missing it. Both cases are different kinds of self-righteousness. You know, back to that movie I watched, it's like, it's a total takedown of conservatives. It's meant to be in that movie. And I thought as I was watching it going, yeah, but we could say the same thing probably about the New York Times, probably CNN. And on both sides, right and left in our country today, you see a misunderstanding of God in so many ways. It's not an absolute distinction, it's relative, I get that, but here's the deal. That seeps into our lives when as people who come to church, I know a lot of us do here, uh, who hear the gospel being preached ably and faithfully, as I know it is here, we can begin to relate to God like the older brother or the younger brother. We begin to say to ourselves, God's pretty stingy. I know he says he has my best at heart, but I don't believe him, and I'm going to live that out. So here's, here's a question. Which, which son are you? Are you saying, hey, I don't need religion. That, that's your thing. It's not mine. Um, my life's pretty good. That's younger son thinking. Is that you? 
Have you given up on Christianity and given up on your father's house and said, I want to do it for me? Jesus calls you home. And he says, I want to invite you to relate to your father in a way that you've never may have thought about before, which is God is better than you ever expected and his generosity is greater than you ever imagined. Maybe you're like the older son. You're, you're kind of upright, respectable, and religious. All the major sins are hidden. Isn't that interesting as we walk with Jesus? Just as an aside, I was talking to a friend of mine who's one of the godliest guys I know. He's kind of one of my heroes in the faith. And he, he's, I think, 55, and he told me, he said, Gabe, you know, when I was in my 20s and become a Christian, he said, I thought to myself, you know, I'm 55, I'll be further along. And he said, what I'm astonished at is that the longer I walk with Jesus, I'm more astonished at how little I've gone, how far I have to go, how much sin remains. And isn't it a true principle in our lives as Christians that the closer you get to Jesus, the more you see your sin? As one author put it, the closer you get to the light, the more you're aware that you have a shadow. And that's how it is in our lives. And, and as we get older in the faith and as we walk with Jesus, we can begin to be good at hiding the big sins. We don't murder people outright. We're just angry and irritable all the time. We don't go cheat on our spouse and commit adultery, but we always take the second look at who we shouldn't or fantasize about something we shouldn't. We don't really outright gossip about somebody. We, do, we cloak our jealousy and envy of somebody under the guise of prayer requests. That's how we do it. The big sins get hidden, the quote-unquote big sins, and then what we're ignoring the whole time, what the older brother missed, is that the sin in our heart is worse than we could possibly imagine. And both the brothers had heart sins that were greater than they could ever fathom. Both underestimated the depth of their sin. And that's because both overestimated their own power and underestimated the father they served. And that is such a temptation for us today, friends. Such a temptation to be like one of these two brothers. And so here's, here's a question again to ask yourself. Am I irritable? You know, we... we we kind of pass that off today. Sure, we all get mad in traffic. Yeah, what does that say about our hearts, though? Yeah, we all get a little bit cranky from time to time. Okay, but what does it say about our hearts? And here's what Jesus does. Again, he's pressing in on us here. He's saying, you are looking to something other than me when you're irritable. Because something hasn't been met, and you think God is stingy. And that's why you're cranky. You think you deserve one thing like the older brother, and you don't get it, so you don't think you need to come into the party and think you can insult the father. And what he comes back to us and says is, get rid of that kind of thinking. Get rid of the thinking that says you will find pleasure and satisfaction outside of me, and get rid of the thinking that says God really doesn't like me at all, and he's harsh, and he won't give me the best for my life. And when we understand that, 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 that what Jesus is doing here, we'll start to move from a religiosity to reception. Reception of his grace. Reception of his love. Can we just pause here and wonder for a second at a God who would do what he did for the younger son? And I want to press this home because I see so much confusion on this today. And that is this. People... I'm not trying to sound like a hall monitor, like, you know, I've got all the answers, everybody else is in confusion, but what you see is this. People, people who, are, who are saying to themselves and, and saying to the world around them, you know, everything's kind of the same. All religions teach the same thing. I can find what the gospel offers somewhere else, and let me just say, you will never read, again, the, the parable of the prodigal son anywhere else. And I know that because it's only in the Bible, only Jesus says it. What I mean is the principles behind it are nowhere else. Grace is in no other worldview. None. Try it out. Go search. How do you get to heaven in Islam? You do your best with the five, and we could add maybe six pillars to begin to read the Quran. And even then, it's arbitrary, guys. I'm not caricaturing that view. Even then, you're not quite sure how it ends up. 
How do you get right with God according to Joseph Smith and Mormonism? Works. How do you get right with God according to Eastern Orthodoxy? By following the sevenfold counsel of the church and the desert fathers and works again. That might be oversimplification, but I think I can demonstrate that. How do you get right with God in Roman Catholicism? Works. There's a great debate between William Whitaker, the, the Puritan, and Cardinal Bellarmine, one of the most foremost Roman Catholic exponents of the late 16th century. At the end of this debate, they've been debating Scripture. It's in a huge tome now, which I just love the titles back then, Disputations on Holy Scripture. Okay, so dispute, we don't do disputations anymore. I kind of feel like we need to. Anyway, um, so he's got this great volume. You know what Bellarmine said to Whitaker, the Puritan who's defending the gospel and grace alone? You know what he said at the end of the debates? He said, your problem, sir, is that you believe in the great heresy of assurance. Now that lays it out, doesn't it? And it's totally logical, friends. Because if you believe what these other religions teach about God and you relate to God based on your performance, how do you ever know there's enough? That might sound like a simplistic question, but we're still waiting for a good answer. That's what Bellarmine meant. If you're doing this, there's no way you're going to ever know you're going to heaven for sure, which is why the Council of Trent anathematized anybody. And that said, you're anathema, you're out if you believe you can know for sure you're going to heaven, my friends. If you believe what Jesus says here, you will know for sure your Father loves you and you're going to heaven. That is the birthright of every Christian in here. You should wake up and put your feet on the ground each morning and say, if I die today, I will see him. I will say with Paul, it is better to be with Christ and depart this life. You'll say with the thief on the cross, forgive me, let me be with you today. And Jesus will say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Far from being a heresy, the heresy would be to say that there's no way you can know for sure you're saved. And that's because you still have an older brother mindset. And so, in all of this, grace becomes amazing again. And we can't miss one major aspect of this parable. If we just interpret it as Jesus telling us a nice story, we miss what I've been trying to bring out this whole time is that this parable costs. And it costs Jesus his life to tell it. Because The Father's love appeased the Father's wrath through the offering of the Son on the cross. So the reason that Jesus can assure us that this story is true is because the Father's wrath was spent on him and not on us. And the joy of the feast that is to come in the resurrection in the age to come is secured by the one who died and was raised again on our behalf. So once again, we come back that this is a story about death and resurrection. It's a story about Jesus and what he did for us as much as it is about the Father's heart for us because the Father's heart is always shown to us in the sacrificial death and triumphant resurrection of his son. Now, there's a story I came across in um, Phil Riken's commentary on this passage, which is just an amazing book anyway. It's in that Reformed Expository series. And I haven't written in it. I don't get any fees or anything. Go buy it. It's every volume in there is good. There's, there's a, a, an author he cites named Alexander McCall Smith who wrote a book called The Number One Ladies Detective Agency. And in this story, the, these, these are a group of detectives in um, Botswana in Africa. And they're working with white schoolmasters and, and missionaries and everything else. And in this story uh, that that Smith tells, there's a teacher in Botswana who has a son that's kidnapped. And eventually, he thinks his son is dead, but the the lady's detective agency finds him. And I want you to listen to Alexander McCall Smith describing the scene in this novel when the son is reunited with his father. Quote, the school teacher looked out the window of his house and saw a small white van draw up outside. He saw the woman get out and look at his door and the child. What about the child in the car? Was she a parent who was bringing her child to him for some reason? He went outside and found her at the low wall of his yard. You are the teacher, sir, she asked. I am the teacher, ma'am. Can I do anything for you? 
She turned to the van and signaled to the child within. The door opened and his son came out. And the teacher cried out and ran forward and stopped to look at the detective as if for confirmation. She nodded and he ran forward again, almost stumbling, an unlaced shoe coming off to seize his son and hold him while he shouted wildly, incoherently, for the village and the world to hear his joy. I can't think of a better illustration of what Jesus has just told us than that for sinners like you and me. Let's pray. God, thank you for the endurance of these dear folks to go this far this morning. Thank you for your word. May it refresh us. May the food we're about to receive refresh our bodies. And once again, thank you for answering prayer and giving us our daily bread. Bless us with the manna of your word on our pilgrimage, with a fresh taste of your love and grace and a fresh vision of the wonder of it all. In Christ, we pray in his name. Amen.